Welcome everyone, good evening. What are the questions tonight? Yes. Um, I was wondering, I was listening to a lecture <clears throat> recently and you were talking about um, in Ram Leela when um, Ram came to the sages in the forest and they were meditating on Krishna and they were like, Ram, and he was like, no, I'm not Krishna, you can, um, I'll come back later, but I guess that's kind of confusing to me, because I had always thought that, like, um, Raj Bhakti was, like, is it off, are there devotees trying to attain Raj Bhakti in, like, every yuga? But then I had heard that, like, it's rare, is it just rare in Kali, Kali Yuga, or is it mm -hmm. always? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the, um, the dispensation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is considered to be rare, once in the day of Brahma. Rupa Goswami's uh, verse has, uh, if, um, from his dramas, is invoked by um, Krishnanas in his um, um, Chaitanya Charitamrita, where he uses it as a verse of benediction, describes the rarity of that uh, benediction dispensation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, there's a couple ways to think about that. Um, one is that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is distributing um, the highest mellows of love of God in a systematic way in a guru parampara that's focused on that, that on the ground if you will, it provides a lot of support for that. And I say that, for example, in comparison to uh, some of those who uh, expressed similar sentiments for, for Gopi Bhav, uh, for um, 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 the uh, emphasis on, on Radha, um, whom whose poems hmm, he uh, relished in his Auntie Leela hmm, when he was very much absorbed in his internal life. Uh, poems of those like Jaidev, uh, Vidyapati, um, Chandidas, and so forth. Um, so there is some idea there in those poems about corresponding with what he was about. Hmm. We find um, in, in Gita Govinda, for example, a famous story in which um, the author Jaidev is writing, and and he gets this. He's writing the poem Gita Govinda, and um, and he's as he's envisioning it, he sees Krishna bowing to the feet of Radha. And he thinks, wait a minute, you know, Krishna is the supreme personality of God. Everybody bows to him. I must be crazy. Where am I going with this? And so he puts it down. And he and he goes out for a breath of fresh air, and and um, it's an extended one apparently. And so he comes back, and his wife is taking her dinner. He says, well, Why are you taking dinner? You know, before me, and you know. Usually you cook and wait for me and so forth. She said, what are you talking about? You, were here. you ate a half an hour ago. Are you crazy? And, uh, and so he says, I must be, you know. He goes into his room and he's trying to figure out what happened. And he opens his book. And there he sees that his thoughts that he dared not write were written in. So the idea is that, he, that Krishna came and disguised himself as Jaidev ate dinner and went in and wrote and the line and then and then went out and so these are the kind of books that uh, that uh, he was writing and that Mahabra was um, verses from which were being supplied to him by Ramananda by uh, Srup Damodar to augment his, his moods and his really internal pursuit of entering into the ecstasy of uh, the love of Radha. Um, but 
to understand those books, what's being said there, and so forth, is, is a whole other thing. So you have some some persons uh, that could be analogous in some ways to the Alwars and Ramanuja. Alwars were poets, mystics, they wrote and so forth. But Ramanuja came and systematized their theological insights so into a theological system of Vedanta called Vishishta Dvaita. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't do that with works like that of Jayadev, but he gave that work and empowered um, uh, those whom he gave it to 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 do that. The Goswamis came out with their Gaudiya Vedanta, Chinti Beda Beda, and so forth. Um, so the comparison is apt in that sense, in that now you have with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu a sampradaya, a systematic approach to those ideals that are there in the scripture. They're not unknown. It isn't that Shaitanya Mahaprabhu made the ideas up. They're there if you look uh, deeply. Mm -hmm. And so um, they, and and, um, and you know, how, how they're accessible to persons like Jayadev or uh, Chandidas or before them Long before them, the sages of Dandakaranya, the uh, personified Upanishads, and so forth. Um, well, uh, it, it's said that the sages were chanting the Gopal Mantra, so it's found in the Gopal Tapani Upanishad. So if you chant it, you're going to get that kind of uh, result. That idea is there. So again, these are core ideas that are in the texts. But the Sampradaya of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is bringing them out in great detail and giving support in so many ways for pursuing them in a systematic way. Um, and so um, you're going to find some examples like that. And the Goswamis, in their writing, they draw on those examples from the from the Puranas describing the sages of Dandakaranya, the Upanishads, and so forth. Statements about them are made in the Bhagavatam, so they describe them as those who entered into into Gopi Bhava in groups, and there are those that come individually. So there were the groups of the sages, groups of the Upanishads personified, certain Upanishads personified uh, is the idea. Um, now, that said, besides the fact that what uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was doing is giving a systematic and uh, system and support group for attaining Gopi Bhava. Mm -hmm. He's also, uh, through his uh, dispensation, making available a special kind of Gopi Bhava that was not available to those sages. Mm -hmm. And that is the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the extreme Radha that uh, um, is uh, described, for example, in Chaitanya Charitamrita and the Ramananda Sambhad as the highest sadhya, the highest goal, and the, and the corresponding practice to attain it. It is the way in which one can come as close to experiencing what Krishna, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, desired to experience. You can't become Radha. Hmm? You could become a gopi. Hmm? But to become a like the, like Rupa and Raghunath, become a handmaiden of Radha in a very special kind of Madhurya Rasa. Hmm? There's uh, Samboga and Tadbhava. Samboga means to be a gopi and have a romantic relationship with Krishna. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Uh, it's completely selfless, but that's a form of uh, of, of gopi bhav. Then the Tadbhava is is rather than having a, uh, a direct Samboga relationship with Krishna, to have uh, attach oneself to the bhava of one who has a direct relationship with Krishna and a sister. And there are different forms of that. 
So like Lalita and Vishaka, who are principal gopis in all the Goswami's uh, texts, uh, Leela books and so forth, they are Paramaprishta gopis. They're like capable of being Yuteshwaras or group leaders and having a direct relationship with Krishna, having their own Manjari's friends and so on and so forth, like Chandravali has her own group, right? But they subordinate themselves to Radha hmm? and um, stay in her group. Hmm? And so theirs is a kind of Tadbhav, and then they have direct assist- assistance, Priyasakis. Hmm? Theirs is a kind of t- type of Tadbhav also, tasting the Bhav of Radha. But both the Parama Priyasakis and the, and the uh, Priyasakis, they also may, at the request of Radha, hmm, have direct relationship union with Krishna at times. Hmm. But then, then there's the then there's the Manjaris, hmm, Nityasakis, and also they're called what's the other name? Um, Anyway, there's two types. Hmm. It just have two types of two names for manjaris. Forget the other one. One is referring to sadhakas who have attained. The, one is to attain the nityasiddhas who are manjaris. Hmm. So, so they're sadhakas. They can attain that, um, and they have a st- extreme. They're not friends of Radha, like the priyasakis or the paramakrishasakis. They're servants of Radha in their disposition. In a broader sense, they could be called friends, but Raghunath Das Goswami makes a statement, I don't want to be the friend. That's too high for me. I always want to be the servant. But then, you know, speaking, if you understand that the, the nature of Gaudi Vaishnavism, he's talking, he wants the highest thing, because Das Das and Das, he wants to be the servant. So, um, then their position and of course, they they appear in the leela as as young girls who haven't reached adolescence yet, mm-hmm. and so they have access to the intimacy of Radha and Krishna, where other girls are a little older wouldn't necessarily. Which is just a way of saying their extreme um, um, dedication uh, to Radha mm-hmm, affords them through their attachment to her bob exclusively, hmm, with no tinge of the desire for some bog, direct union for Krishna, it is is um, the closest then one can get to being Radha oneself, is the idea. So, in, in one sense, they look, well, selfless, they let others go forward, but if you look carefully, they're actually going to the highest position, themselves. They don't want to have direct union with Krishna. They want to serve the one who has the most complete union with Krishna, who can fully satisfy Krishna. Mm -hmm. And so Krishna's mind goes to them and and, and thinks very in a very special way about them. And so the math, as I've sometimes said underneath it all, is that they're figuring out the way to please Krishna the most, who is which is what Bhakti Rasa (laughs) It's about. It takes the form of pleasing Radha, who's his other self. So it's this very extreme. And then you find, for example, prayers of Raghunath Das Goswami, where he says, "Who cares about Krishna? We want nothing to do with him, hmm? shunning him, you know, uh, and rather taking Radha's side and so forth." So this very extreme form of tadbhav hmm, in Madhuri Rasa. It takes the shape of a kind of dasya, hmm? servitude to Radha, but it's a division of Madhurya rasa, hmm? kanjugu, shringa rasa, romantic love. Hmm? And this is a, this is then a special contribution or opportunity that's made available with the descent of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that that can be, in the fullest sense of the term, um, uh, be. Uh, is in the fullest sense of the term what Rupa Goswami talks about when he says 
una tojla rasam sabakti sri om in his benediction una tojla ujwala rasa is the madhurya rasa but una to ujwala then speaks of a, a special form of the madhurya rasa and he's giving this uh um uh, uh, benediction of the world and through the agency really of, of Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami, uh Jiva Goswami, the six Goswamis, hmm? um who were the core, you know, uh uh kind of architects of the Sampradaya, the writers of the main literature and so forth, um in in this in, in, in philosophical literature, theological literature. Um and um and so this is a, this is a sense then how what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to give is only given when he is here, when he comes once in the day of Brahma, which is very very rare. Now you could say that he comes once in the day in the Brahma, but it takes several days of Brahma for somebody to attain the dispensation that he gives, so they could be hanging around in other yugas and. And, and and so forth. Um, I suppose you could make an argument like that. But this is the way, I think, to uh, to think about the special dispensation of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, both as a systematic dispensation hmm, and with a lot of support, so many acharyas, so many writings and everything, and then the very specialty quality of the Madhurya Rasa within that as well. Hmm. So, and it's said, it's thought that in Chaitanya Charitamrita where Krishnadas Kaviraj describes uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he sees the sand dune and he sees it as Govardhan and he runs after it and he falls into a trance and then he's brought out of his trance by the devotees. He said, I was there at Govardhan Hill. I saw the gopis and Krishna and the, the gopis engaged me in Collecting some flowers and bringing the, that that in that instance he himself, Krishna as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, tasted the manjari bhav. It's a very special, delicious form of madhurya rasa. In that instance, he tasted it himself, and so again, you can't become Radha. You can't compete with Radha. You could become a, a gopi of different uh, different types of gopis and so forth. But no one is more. Um, the complete form of Madhurya Rasa than Radha. They're all partial manifestations of Radha. So to follow in their footsteps is one thing. To follow in the footsteps of Radha, you can't be here, but be her, but you can get so identified with her that um, it's said that, um, yeah, I, I believe that in the first verse, I think it's the first verse of Rabbanath Asko Swami's uh, What is the book uh, I'm thinking of? No, that's no, it's on top of, uh, Yeah, it's um, um, uh, he wrote in the bank of Radhakund. Um Vilap Kusumanjali. There, there's uh, he's speaking about writing about Manjari Bob. He's having experience. He's coming back, writing about it, and um, I think he he mentions it. That, uh, that uh, there's some scratch on appearing on Rupa Manjari, asking where it comes from, something like that. And she had no, like a love, you know, bite or something like that. Um, and um, she had no contact with Krishna. So the implication is that Radha experienced it. She's so identified with Radha, like the stigmata. Stigmaticus, stigmatica of the Catholics, where they get so absorbed in the Christ that some of them manifest the the, um, the um, holes, yeah, from the crucifixion, the uh, symptoms of the crucifixion, or some semblance of that. Hmm. Um, so they are so absorbed in Radha that that that, that, that appears. Um, there is Varup. So it's just an example, then, of the extreme 
form of uh, Radha Dasyam. Sometimes it's called a Manjari Bhava or Bhavulasa. Hmm. Very special. So that particular discipline is not like the gopis, the, the, the sages Dandakaranya attained that. Hmm. After all, Rama appeared before him. They, they could understand this is the person who we're, who we're chanting. looks a little different, but that's him. And he said, no, I, I have only one wife. So they wanted to have some bhog with him, with Krishna. Or the sages of Dandakaranya, that's, that's, that's a, that whole range of some bhog, that type of gopi bhav is, is considered secondary by Rupa Goswami to any form of tad bhav in, in, in Madhurya Rasa. They want to speak of the Manjari's form of it. Hmm? That is the, that's the position of Rupa Goswami, Jiva Goswami, Rabbanat Goswami, is what they were um, experiencing, what they are participating in. So you can understand that their commentaries on Bhagavatam, their Leela narratives that are based on the Bhagavatam and other Puranas that bring out so many details. They're privy to the kind of thing. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Another question? Um, I was listening to a lecture some time ago that you gave a long time ago about humility. And it was, you were talking about that Trinadapi verse of the Shikshasta come, but we were talking about two levels of humility. And I wish I could remember more about it. it well, there's more than two, but I mean, the prominent ones for the Sadakas our kind of humility, in one sense, is expressed in the second verse of Shikshasta, coming in the kind of humility that's ex- that's um, spoken about in the, uh, the, the third verse. Third verse is a popular um, emphasis on uh, humility. The third verse corresponds with nishta. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's when you come experientially in proximity to the ideal, hmm, then naturally there, this humility naturally awakens. But Mahaprabhu's second verse where he says he, he expresses some type of lamentation and it, it also can be seen as a kind of humility. He says, he says he extols the virtues of the name. The name has all the powers of Krishna, all his shakti, and at the same time, makes himself completely accessible to the extent to which, unlike other Vedic mantras and so forth, meant for bringing about some type of yogic uh, union, divine union with with the Godhead, with the Absolute, these uh, these names, they they of Krishna, they have no uh, rules and regulations attached to them. Uh, there's no prerequisite for chanting them. You don't have to face one direction or other. You can do it in your sleep, uh, and it'll be benefit. It's, it, it said so forth. Um, you can chant while eating. It said in the Bhagavatam. Just to emphasize the point, right? So the the name is is ext- has all the power of Krishna Sarva Shakti, and at the same time is com- makes himself completely accessible in the form of the name. So how generous is the name, and then he reflects, and how unfortunate am I that Nananuraga, I have no attraction for it. He's, he's setting it up, you know, like, I should be really, really attracted to this. This is fantastic. I should be running after this, but I find no attraction in myself. And so it's a kind of humble admission, if you will, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, um, that if we can embrace that kind of uh, humility, the name will stay with us despite our lack of attraction owing to eons and eons of material distraction, material samskars and so forth. If we have this healthy kind of uh, um, remorse, if you will, not some neurosis, but some healthy kind of remorse, then uh, the, the name will continue to stay with us and in due course these and Arthas will be removed, and so on. Whereas, so that's a, an expression of, of humility. 
but then in the Trinata piece in each verse, in each verse, as much as that ver- that verse, third verse of Shikshastakam is sp- speaking about the stage of nishta. Mahaprabhu in the previous verse is speaking about anishta. So I have a principal anarthas that are getting in my way, so I have no attraction hmm, because of my past. So uh, he's remorseful about that. He has kind of a lament and he's feeling humbled. Um, but nishta is characterized by, well, the principal anarthas are, are put aside and they're not capable in that stage of interfering with one's practice of chanting, hmm, of bhakti. And so, as a result of that, your your experience might be fleeting and anishta is now con- is consistent. Hmm? And um, so it's, it's humbling in another way. And I'm in touch with this and I'm feeling I'm close to that I'm entering into a, a, a world that is uh, like I'm a new new bhakta here in the, you know in a in a world of bhakti, hmm? mm-hmm. starting to get the, the, some consistent uh, ex- experience of that or something like that, um, and uh, and understand it of course intellectually as well as uh, part of that, um, and so. Uh, I want to say that the re- the hum- humility that he's talking about, he kind of mandates it there. It's at the same time, it's it's kind of part of of, real, of a realization hmm? uh, that naturally humbles one. That's why it's difficult to just be more blade humble than a blade of grass. You need some realization <laughs> and, and, and experience of just how small you are. Because I can tell you theoretically, or you can tell yourself that you're small, but when you experience how small you are, then it's, it's humbling. Hmm? And, and of course, that, as much as nishta is, is about, in one sense, as I said, being theoretically informed, therefore the verse in the Bhagavad that said to correspond with it, nasta prayeshu badreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya, bhagavati tamoshlakir bhaktir bhavati bhaktir Naistiki means nishtan, speaking about someone that's well-schooled in the Bhagavad, hmm, has regularly heard the Bhagavad. Hmm. So, in, in one sense, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a person whose practice is well-informed. Hmm. But the humility that arises at the same time is evidence that his well-informed practice has afforded him experience to know that what he or she knows is nothing. While well, everybody else thinks, boy, he knows a lot. Hmm. To see, he knows the verses and so many things, but he knows. <laughs> you don't know <laughs> what what he is. Hmm. See, Marsh used to say, "Unknown, unknowable." He's unknown and unknowable. The more you know about him, the more you know you don't know about him. He's like that, and he's like that. And and so forth, and and it's like that. That's what's being said. Oh, that's what's being said, and so forth. So it's it's um, the experience is very humbling. Hmm? So that kind of humility. I mean, we we mandate it. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mandate mandate it. He says, you know, that this is the decorum of the devotee. But it's hard to just adapt. So we can adapt the first kind of humility, if you will, and kind of lament in a healthy, not in a Neurotic way that that geez, this is a, this is a, such as the this is the the uh, extraordinary position of the name in terms of its power and its um, uh, grace mm-hmm. and but for a long time I've had been distracted <laughs> over a lifetime so I've got a the, the repository of distractions some scars that take me in different directions so. I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunate I can't fully take advantage, but I won't let go. Hmm? So with a, with a little little, uh, this is the this is the uh, what Krishna says in the, in the Bhagavatam also about his devotees that they may have material desires, they may get distracted, but they have a healthy remorse for that, and that's all that's required for to remedy the distractions that play themselves out. Hmm? Of course, if you have a healthy remorse, then it's you know obviously it's hard to keep 
keep doing that. Hmm? Um, so, <laughs> uh, uh, what he's basically saying is, what to do? Can't go anybody else and ask for you know forgiveness. <laughs> they've approached me. They, they've they've taken it to Ananya Bhakti. That means they're taken to me exclusively. Hmm? And they're imperfect in taking to me exclusively, but they're not seeking to perfect their taking shelter of me by taking shelter somewhere else. They're not that stupid. Hmm. That, um, you know, there was the, the there's a story that Sridhar Maharaj told that he met one one fellow at one time who said to him that, oh, you're the follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yes, his teaching is very high, but if we are really to do it properly, first we should follow the path of the Buddha and understand everything that the Buddha realized. Then we can follow the path of Shankar and everything that Shankar realized. And then so and so. And then when these, that's complete, then we can take up the, the pursuit of the Radha Dasyam of Ch- Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And so and Sridhar said to him, that's very interesting the way you put that. I like that, but uh, it's not what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught. <laughs> so we don't do it like that. <laughs> Is he taught that yet it is very high, it's very exalted, it's a, but I'm making it available. However imperfectly, however imperfect you are, you're perfect by embracing that ideal, however imperfectly. Now try to perfect your embrace of it, that you won't let go of it regardless of what happens, However, you get distracted and so forth, and you don't have any idea because you're well informed that you can improve your capacity to take exclusive shelter of Krishna by taking shelter somewhere else, in some other practice or something like that. No, no, don't do that. And 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 he says this. And he says this way, my devotees, you know, I I take care of them. So there's there there is this learning care of a Bhajana Kriya where your practice is up and down and. Distractions and so forth. They should loom large for us. At the same time, they're they don't, not that big in Krishna's eyes. But we shouldn't take it quite like that. That we that that becomes so it becomes an excuse for carrying on. And when we are distracted in certain ways, and, and Bhakti will make it clear to us, it's time to move on from that. You know, and she'll put us in a situation where it's clear, time to move on from that. And we. There's two things in bhakti: that it's grace, and then there's our effort. So now you got to make some effort here, and I'll give you support, something like that. So, so that's uh, then. There's higher forms of humility as well, where in Brihad Bhagavatam, Sanatan Goswami equates the, the, the humility of the preem because hmm, with bhakti itself, hmm, the humility fosters bhakti, and the bhakti fosters humility. So that's a higher ideal, not so much. Maybe you could say brought out in the Shikshastakam, in the last verse of Shikshastakam. sounds very humble, what Raha Radha is speaking there. But that's kind of, you know, otherwise humility is like separate from bhakti, and it's, uh, it's a quality that comes as a result of bhakti. But when bhakti becomes synonymous with humility, that's that's a higher end. Does that help? Yeah, I think that's what you're yeah. referring to, right? What else? Could you just say quickly, <laughs> speaking of feeling small, how long is the day of Brahma again? <laughs> it's big. The day of Brahma is, um, is uh, I think, a, a thousand of the yuga cycles. So the Kali Yuga is thought to be 432,000 years, and then the Treta Yuga is 800-some thousand years, and then the Tret, then the the... the, the uh, I said Dwarpa and then Treta Yuga is like 1.2 million years, and then the Satya Yuga is, I don't know, 1.8 million years or something like that. So you put all those together, it's... That's a Divya Yuga, that's that's one day of Brahma. I think that's like, must be like 4,360,000 years or something like that. One Divya Yuga, so that's one day of Brahma, and so is his night also. <laughs> So it's that's a long time, um, and uh, and then he lives for a hundred years. So life of Brahma is a long time. But the day of Brahma you asked about, right? Yeah. So the day of Brahma. So once in a once in a Divya Yuga. So you know, in another sense, 
you could say, well, with, uh, the benediction is coming very rarely. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they say never before, because it's just like too far back to, you know, uh, to think, well, it came eight million, you know, three hundred eight billion, whatever, eight million three hundred sixty thousand years ago, you know. So, so, <laughs> no, something like that. Very. So the and the emphasis is, of course, it's a rare opportunity. So take advantage of it now. Uh, these yuga cycles, these were, this is was what this is about, and really in Hinduism is just the mapping of time. They mapped time. Hmm? If that makes any sense to you. They, they, you know, charting the heavens and so forth, and they, they made their time calculations from that. <clears throat> and, uh, and they considered quality, so they looked at the, the quality of the constellation or configuration in the heavens and that was this Kali, for example, this yuga, that yuga. So it's, uh, it's, it's in one sense more about a quality of time, mm -hmm. although it, it has a quantitative uh, measurement of its extent uh, as well. Okay, so, anyway. Um, yes? I've heard you a couple times tell the story of the devotee of Mahaprabhu who um, offended him somehow so that Mahaprabhu said, I don't want to see him. Yeah, Kal Krishnadas. Yeah, well, how did he offend Mahaprabhu? Well, I, I don't know if he offended Chaitanya Mahaprabhu per se, but in South India he got, uh, uh, he was Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's assistant. And he got distracted by some tribal people. Oh, a different one, Mukunda. Okay, um, Mukunda. Mukunda. Um, I think um, Mukunda was like uh, um, ecumenically disposed and uh, frequented some type of. Um, uh, some c circle where where Gyan was was um, uh, taught to be superior to Bhakti, um, which also enraged Mahaprabhu when when Advaita took that position in order to get the outrage of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, so he could prove that I'm subordinate to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, although he's much younger than me. Hmm teach that point of Siddhanta. So I think that Mukunda, I, I'm, 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 I'm just, uh, my memory's not great, but I think something like that. But the whole thing is a ruse. I mean, you know, he, he, Mahaprabhu was um, also teaching. So he used his different devotees at different times to teach different points. Like, like, like the Chodhari Das, Mukunda and so forth, but um, uh, he showed some anger at Nityananda Prabhu when he broke his danda and so forth. But actually, he was pleased internally. So externally, he would he was externally he was displeased with with Sarvabhoma when he changed the word of the Bhagavatam from Mukti to Bhakti. You can't change the word of the Bhagavatam. That's wrong. But internally, he was pleased with him. So he used them in different ways. So. So Mukunda was, uh, yeah, I, I think it was something that was banished from Mahaprabhu's association. The devotees would go and see him, and all he ever wanted to know was when I will get Mahaprabhu's darshan again. When they came back to Mahaprabhu, and they said, we visited with Mukunda, so who cares about him? <laughs> hmm. What did he say? <laughs> You know, he said that uh, he only wants to know when he'll ever get your association, and he's just living for that. Mahaprabhu says to tell him, life for life of Brahma, something like that. Yeah. Thousand births. Huh. Then he went back, and they, what did Mahaprabhu say? Oh, he said, not for a thousand births, and Mukunda began to celebrate. I will get his association again. Yeah. And then when they came back to Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu said, what did he say? <laughs> 
he started celebrating that he'll get his associ- your association again. That's all he wanted to know that he would get it. Mahaprabhu said, I'll bring him here immediately. So it's a fairly a story of affection for Mukunda. But if my remembrance is correct as to why Mahaprabhu showed um, some displeasure, the lesson is for us. Hmm? We don't go to the, in those circles. Hmm? Um, Sadhaka should stay in. In, in, uh, in, the, in the circle of of the culture of bhakti, hmm. become strong, something like that. Does that help? Yeah. I have a follow up to Simanti's question. Um, I was reading in Shikshatsakam about the third verse, and you talk about two different types in Nishta, and I keep reading it, and I, I'm still confused about it. It's like there's you talk about the two different well, one may be steady in humility. One may be steady, for example, in tolerance. One may be steady in um, in uh, this, de- this decorum, accepting no honor for oneself, offering honor to others. These are like thought to be some type of like assistant, in a sense, to bhakti proper. Hmm. One may be steady in them, but not be steady in chanting, which is a higher form of of nishta. Hmm. So, two forms of nishta. You'd think they would conform, but you could see you kind of you can kind of see how if you're steady, you could be steady in the first in those those things, but perhaps not as steady in in, in chanting. But then you'd think if you're steady in chanting, the higher form. You'd be steady in those things, but uh, apparently not always uh, always the case. Hmm. So think of it like that. So there's this fourfold kind of decorum. One could be very much steady in those things, which is which is quite an accomplishment. Hmm. But still, be distracted when chanting. It's possible. One could not be distracted from the chanting and still have some some work to do on their their character, something like that. Mm. So both together, that's what we, we want. Does that help? Yeah, so like you're saying, so there's like, so the sad could be, could be like steady. I mean, Mahabra was, is advocating two things there in the verse. He's advocating a certain decorum, right? Humble, tolerance, no expectation of honor for oneself, offering honor to others. And what's the other thing he's talking about? Kirtaniya Sadhari, full of absorption in the chanting. So he's talking about two different things. So you can be steady in either one of those, nishta in either one of those. Um, but nishta in the chanting is more of an accomplishment, and the others should follow hmm, in due course. And then you have, you know, full full face of it, something like that. Mm-hmm. It's not that the guy's going to be proud as a peacock or something like that and have accomplished the give kirtani sadhari. I mean, uh, so. But that is, uh, you know, that is a unique uh, insight of um, Vishwana Chakrati Thakur. I think he uh, talks about that in his. Uh, Madhuri Kadambani. Mm-hmm. So, st- kind of like things steady and things related, to, directly related to bhakti and its culture, and then bhakti itself, something like that. So, in this case, the way the humility and tolerance are talked about, they're related to bhakti. Mm-hmm. So, you, you, the verse is asking you to cultivate them and and in that, having embraced that decorum to chant without, to be fully engaged, and that means. Does that help? Yeah, you got it. Okay. Yes. I was wondering why uh, desires sometimes go underground in a sadhaka's life. Um, 
to kind of show up again, underground show up. Um, like why, why does that happen? Well, it may be relative to their practice. They may be have a real consistent practice that, that doesn't allow them to surface, and then their practice may lapse, and they may say, well, it hasn't been sufficient enough to do away with those some scars, so they arise again. Mm -hmm. Or in the course of your life, without bhakti, desires surface and they go away and they, and they come back again, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're kind of bouncing around in there and, <laughs> and uh, with the, the play of of uh, karma and the way it plays out, they they sometimes become more prominent sometimes less. But in bhakti we're trying to replace the various tendencies for those that correspond with those desires. What we'll to speak of the actions themselves, the te or the desires themselves, the tendencies that give rise to the desires, that give rise to the action. And in one sense we start with action that's different, what we call bhakti. And try to so you can do with the actions, but the desires might still be there. But if bhakti is consistent enough, then the desires won't be able to fructify into action. Still, the, some the tendencies for them may be there. So there's some different levels of cleansing that are required. Hmm. Um, so you know, if you if you separate yourself from situations that f that in the past have fostered. Um, actions and desires that are unfavorable to bhakti and you separate yourself from that and you practice and then you set yourself back in those circumstances you see that the measure of your practice they rise up again with the udipanas for those mm, material desires mm, and you say well I better get back to the temple <laughs> and a good association but in due course it'll be just the opposite that oh, that situation will become deep enough for bhakti even, mm -hmm. but that's that's uh, a lot of cleansing and and, and more than cleansing just for that to occur. And, you know, we see in great devotees we see certain things in ruchi the kirtan in the lower stages of ruchi if the kirtan is not um, well if it's like you singing off key or something like that but you know. It, Somebody in Richie might not get as much from it as someone who can sing with some expertise in in, in kirtan. So there's two stages of Ruchi. Um, and then we go further, just to give an idea that so so a really good class will give a taste or some. Uh, powerful kirtan, you get ruchi from a less powerful kirtan. Now he's still in a stage of ruchi, but it's, it's just a budding stage. And so there, he requires or she requires certain the bhakti experience to be in a certain package for her to have uh, f to foster that taste. If the package is not quite right, it still doesn't come. Then the higher stage of ruchi, even if it's packaged wrong, you know, he or she is experiencing. So we go up the ladder further, even let's say to Bhava Bhakti, the next stage altogether of, of Bhakti, um, uh, next platform of Bhakti, then something is going to remind, serve as an Udipana. There are, there are Udipanas. You know what an Udipana is like, you know, to, uh, to, re to remember, you know, the flute of Krishna. And then you can take him in a certain direction. But when it becomes extreme, then you see things in the natural world. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu saw a cloud and passed out. Hmm? Saw the feather of a peacock and would pa would that would be the tipping point. Hmm? So that's on the other end. Hmm? In Asakti, the last stage of Sadhana Bhakti, then just like when you're chanting in in Anishta Bhajana Kriya, or in Nishta, you're, you're chanting, you're trying to focus the mind on Krishna. And in, in, in Asakti, it works the other way. The mind automatically goes to Krishna. Hmm? So these are kind of two ends of the, of the spectrum of 
of um, in, within within sadhana bhakti. So, take some time. Hmm. So that's one reason for the you know they seem to be gone and they come back something like that. They're they're pretty tenacious and they've been with you around you know for 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 a long time. They cultivated it and they've been you know it's just like if you have um, you know if you think of like a like a stone in which there's you know engraving on it. Hmm? And then you're pouring water on it. Hmm. That's how deep the scars are. Water made the Grand Canyon, so, I mean, it's pretty powerful. But it could take a little time. <laughs> uh, but they say drops of water wither away the stone, right? What's more powerful, water or stone? It looks like the stone, but it, I mean, the water is way more powerful than a stone. Stones cannot change the composition of water, but water can change the composition of stones. But with the addition of a little time, that's all. Hmm. So it may take a little time. And what's a little time? It's only a day for Brahma, eight million. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so you you know, yeah, the relative worlds, you have to you know, look at a different perspective. I mean that happens to you also. It will, you're pretty young but now but when you get when you're younger, you know, uh, there's a big difference between twenty and twenty-three. Whoa, and twenty-eight, like whoa. I'm like, I'm really getting up there, you know. I'm really thinking differently. But it's not much difference between fifty and fifty-five. It's like, you know, okay, I've arrived. You know, the, di- the difference is is much smaller. The perspective. So the older people can can like plan ahead. Younger people got to have it now, you know. So they can't, got to wait a year? Yeah, you got to wait. Yeah, you got to go to school for four years, you know, or they go in the military for two years. It's an investment. Huh. Did they harness their youth and, you know, focus it? And the whole world is, seems to be offering itself opportunities uh, to you and, and so on. But with time, then an age, then time looks differently and you can start to make an investment and then they put their money into a CD and it's going to come out <laughs> later on, you know, 20 years later, you know, it's okay, <laughs> something like that. So with time invested in bhakti also, uh, you know, a couple of births, hmm, no big deal. Hmm. You have to look, think like Mukunda. I will get, I will get this association. That's, and as that starts to become the prominent thinking, then it'll happen very quickly. Then, you understand? All right, we we'll stop there. Shri Gaurada Madhava ki jai, Gauri Vaishnava Guru Parampara ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, Gaur Prema.